All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to your last session of the day. How's everyone doing so far? Excellent. Uh, well, my name is Stephanie, and I'm a local. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing your speaker for this for this session. He is a principal engineer at Raytheon with six years of experience in cybersecurity with expertise in software assurance and, and secure development life cycles. He is the primary author of Raytheon's Secure Coding Standard, and prior to joining Raytheon, he was a software engineer and a systems engineer in commercial telephony. He, he holds five U.S. patents in, on intelligence networks. He's a graduate of Texas Tech University with a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in, in Electrical Engineering, and he has made two joint presentations at the RSA Security Conference in 2010 and 2012. Today he will, be, he, will, he will be presenting the topic of software assurance. Please help me welcome John Whited. Hey, thank you all for being here. I told my wife this is the last, uh, last session of the day and I'd be lucky to have two people. So I, this is actually a, a, an overwhelming crowd. I appreciate y'all coming. So I'll keep it pretty informal. It's just, just us guys here. So. Um, now, one remark, she, I do have a degree in electrical engineering. I haven't done any electrical engineering in 35 years. So it's all been software and systems pretty much in my career. All right, thank you for being here. Okay, so uh, this is C. I don't know if anybody even writes C anymore. Or are these all Java and other fun languages? But does anyone see anything wrong with this simple C program? Do you see anything that might be a problem from a security point of view? Anything can jump out at you? Yeah. Oh, no problem. <laughs> yes, that is correct. That is a big, big no-no. So we're going to look at this uh, a little bit later. And uh, <clears throat> there are actually five flaws that I spot in this thing. And we'll talk about those at, at an appropriate time in the illustration later. But, you know, it, it's later in the presentation. Uh, enumerate all the flaws. So there's our little outline. Uh, I don't need to read that to you. I do, we'll try to save about five minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, I'll say that I tend to go, to, you know, a lot of these presentations, you'll have maybe, you know, a slide that somebody talks to for 10 minutes, you know, with not a lot of information, but you listen, right? <clears throat> I'm a very visual person, <clears throat> and therefore I insist that all my audiences be very visual, so I'm going to go through a lot of slides, and so I'll get rolling here. So let's begin with information assurance, and I'm not going to read you every bullet, by the way. I'll let you do that. I hope you get the slides later and digest them in more detail. <clears throat> so when we talk about this topic of information assurance, um, it, you know, you're trying to, uh, it measures that protect, I'm sorry, it is measures that protect and defend information. Uh, and we talk about CIA. Now, it's not Central Intelligence Agency in this case. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And a lot of people forget the availability part. But if a guy can deny the service through a, a start, you know, flood attack, starving your resources, or crashing the program, or preventing you from logging in, you know, that's a denial of service. That attacks availability. That's an IA issue. And then down there at the bottom, <clears throat> you see uh, some other underpinning things that we worry about. Identification. Who are you? authentication, uh, prove your identity. You can't just say who you are without proof. Those things like passwords and two-factor authentication and so forth. Now, once we've authenticated, know who you are, now we need to say, what can you do on this system? So that's authorization. And then we want to record security-related events. That's accountability. And then we don't, don't want you to be able to say, no, I didn't do that later. And that's called non-repudiation. So we don't have time to delve into those topics in detail uh, on this presentation. But those are very uh, core underpinning uh, items in information assurance. <coughs> Excuse me just a minute. <coughs> I took a bite too, I think. <coughs> I don't know how many times I've done that. So, <laughs> um, so this is just a list I made of, from different resources of different topics in the domain or in the framework of information assurance, right? But there's lots of pieces in there, and you see the one I have circled, software assurance. Software assurance or writing code, or I shouldn't say writing code, designing, writing, and testing code and deploying it securely uh, is just one aspect of information assurance, but that's what I focus on today. So there's several things application security is not. You know about network security with firewalls and intrusion detection systems and so forth. You know about hardening. Uh, you know about uh, endpoint security. Uh, but uh, there are common myths that say, well, we have a firewall, 
So we're safe, right? We have a firewall. Well, that's not enough. Um, uh, it's just an internal application. It's a test application. Well, strangely, test applications have a way of crawling out into production at some point. Um, it's protected by single sign-on. Well, remember, we talked about authentication, and that's great, but then we got authorization. Are you allowed to do this? And what's to prevent someone from elevating their privilege? So um, it's not an afterthought. It's not something you want to bolt on afterwards. It's something you want to build in. Uh, and it's not out of scope. It's, it's not a nice to have. Security is something you should consider in doing your projects from the very beginning. I know in a college environment, how many of you are students? One student, okay. How many of you work in industry? <laughs> Double dipping over there. You're an intern? Cool. So there are a lot of things, unfortunately, that, that you, the colleges don't have time to teach you in school. You know, I didn't learn a lot about engineering processes in school because the curriculum is jam-packed with, you know, all these electrical engineering topics, right? Same thing with computer science or with, cyber, with you know, any, anything cyber. But if you really learn to write code securely from the beginning, that's the best. Unfortunately, you don't worry about it as much until you get into industry sometimes. But uh, commend Colin College because they are, you know, focusing on cyber security. They get this conference, right? So I really, uh, really applaud them for that. What application security is, is providing reliable, confidential and valid information at the application layer. Securing the custom code that drives a web application, for example. And as I said before, it's built in, not bolted on. Uh, it's a requirement and a responsibility. So again, I'm not going to read every bullet because we've got a lot of slides. So you see the little diagram in the upper right. We'll, get to, we'll see that later. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the term application security or secure software or secure application development. Uh, those are synonymous to me with software assurance. Now, some of my colleagues at Raytheon quibble with me about that. Oh, no, no, software assurance is just this. Well, you know, it's like the, remember the, the fable from the country of India about six blind men describing an elephant. You know, you touch the trunk, you touch the tail, you touch the, uh, the side of the elephant, you, you get a different picture, right? It's, but to me, it's all very, very highly related. One common definition we go with is from the source you see here, the uh, National Information Assurance Glossary. <clears throat> and software assurance simply says it's the level of confidence that software is free from vulnerabilities, either intentionally designed into the software or accidentally inserted at any time during its life cycle, and that the software functions in the intended manner. Now that definition has been attacked a lot. It's not enough. You, but look, if you want to keep boils down to its essence, that's what it is. There's lots of branches, lots of uh, legs on that. But that's it is what software assurance is about at the, at the core of things. <clears throat> so the way I rephrase that a bit, it does what it's supposed to do. It meets all requirements. That's a very important part of software security. Security and quality do overlap a lot. But in addition to that, software does not do things it's not supposed to do. And I break that down into two categories. There's no Easter eggs. You know, an Easter egg when you're a little kid, or maybe you're a big kid like me, you go out and you see that shiny little, you know, fun thing. Oh, I want that. You know, and so as engineers, we like to do fun stuff. So, oh, that'd be a cool feature to stick in here. Don't do that. If you don't have a requirement for it, or if you're doing Agile, if it doesn't go through a sprint cycle and be approved by the group, don't do that because you're just increasing the attack surface a bad guy has to get into the code. Um, and then also, there's just, you know, we don't write code perfectly. Uh, the fun thing about security is there's no such thing as perfect security. Security, uh, if, it, if there were such a thing, it would cost an infinite amount of money and take an infinite amount of time to implement, right? And so security is about risk management, about doing, doing your due diligence to do all the measures you can reasonably do within the constraints you have of time and money to make the software secure. Uh, but, you know, even if you observe that so-called uh, that's called the uh, principle of least mechanism. You know, write, just write what you need to write. And don't write extra stuff. That's the Easter egg thing. But even then, we're still going to write things that just aren't secure. We'll see some examples in a bit. <clears throat> Safe code breaks it down. You know, different organizations break it down different ways. I encourage you to go Google up Safe code. They've got some great stuff on software security. And they break it down as, uh, into three uh, software assurance into three parts. Security, authenticity, and integrity. Okay, well that's a reasonable definition. Doesn't exactly match what we just read, but as you can see, it's, it, there's lots of different angles and, and views on software assurance. Um, the uh, DHS, the, the, the DOD and the DHS have take, really done a nice job taking the lead on software security in federal systems, okay? Um, and so the, uh, 
they have a software assurance forum, and they the DHS defines it as conformance. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to read this so I don't have time, but I just want to get you the basic concepts. You can read for detail to get the slides. Predictable execution, right? You know what it's going to do every time. Uh, and trustworthiness. There's no exploitable vulnerabilities, for example. Okay? So you see different agents have a different view. I think the important thing to remember about software assurance is that it is... Uh, it, it covers lots of engineering disciplines. It's not just about the software engineers, right? It's about, you need to get buy-in for software assurance from a high level of management as you can in the organization. Okay, so even if you're still a student, you know, be thinking about these things as you go into industry. Um, but you see all the engineering disciplines we have listed there. Okay, so why is it's important? Uh, I don't like this slide, it's too busy, but it does have some good stuff on it. Just, I'm just going to read the title. Software applications is the new attack target, right? Uh, you know, way back when it was network defenses. We break into routers and said, so, well, guess what? People still do, but most people have kind of gotten the message. You know, I really don't want to keep the, the factory ship pass, you know, username and password, you know, on that router. I really shouldn't do that. Um, you know, there are different ways to secure VLANs. So there's all this network defense that we know about. Intrusion detection systems, we're spending billions of dollars on it, and it's not doing the full job. It's an important piece, but it's not doing everything we need it to do. And then endpoint uh, attacks were fun. You know, so attack the operating system uh, or attacks, but now it's more about applications, you know, in, in the core network and the server or perhaps on the endpoint with you at home on your browser. How many were in the last session about how I got on or pwned? Anybody? Nobody? You were? Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, they, they'll attack you anywhere they can get to. And I don't know if I have slide on this. I don't think I do. There's there, there probably you could break it down into more categories, but there are three really, really big threats today. One is the cyber criminals. A lot of, you hear about a lot of that from Russia and Eastern Europe. They they're monetarily motivated. They want to steal your money, right? They want to be they want to get paid. And that is a whole structure. You have people that write the software, you have the bot farmers that host the software, you have the criminals that rent services from the bot farmers. I mean it's it's a quite a quite a picture to go uh, understand in full. Uh, then you have the nation states. I won't mention any nations, but I think we know who some of those nations we're talking about. Uh, they their motivation is political and military, right? They want to steal secrets, and sometimes it's it's also uh, industrial. They want to steal secrets. You know, there was a certain airplane but <clears throat> that a certain country sort of mimicked, and we had to scrap our own program on that. So. I don't want to get into politics in this discussion, but that that did, that was a big issue. And then the third one is the the hacktivists, the you know, anonymous folks. And I know that some of these folks are real well intended, but my view is I don't mind saying this: it, we did not appoint you, God, over us. You know, it's not your right to enforce your what you view as correct on the rest of us. And so this, the hacktivists do a lot of damage uh, to individuals and to companies. Okay, so this little diagram kind of shows a traditional network. You know, we have all these layers. We have it inside. It's got all the good stuff, and it's trusted. Then we got a DMZ. That's a de demilitarized zone. It comes from you know warfare terminology, but it's a place where traffic from the outside is going to come in, and we want to look at it, and make sure it's all right, and have some physical and logical separation between that and our good stuff on the inside. And you you know about all that that picture, right? But what about protocols like like uh, uh, SMTP from email and SSL, which is you know being deprecated in a hurry because of Poodle and and some other things that came up last year. And what about HTTP and HTTPS? You can't do business without those. So what that creates is a situation. You know we can block FTP and Telnet. Let's don't do that anymore, please. Um, people know not to do that. But these others are going to go straight through to the core, right? Unless you have a really good application firewall and some other things like that. And so we get things like Heartbleed, right? <clears throat> uh, how many of you know about Heartbleed? Good. So, <clears throat> you know, that was not only um, a attack on a protocol, it was an attack on a secure protocol. It was what's supposed to help keep us safe from the bad guys. It was actually doing us harm, right? So. And it gets uh, it gets ugly, but the point is that you always are going to have a path into the core. And I think if if you you hear a lot these days about you still want to protect your castle walls, but you know your castle walls are going to be breached. Okay, they're going to come across the moat and over the walls. They're inside. You have to assume people are inside. So you got to keep your application secure as well. And there's high impact of vulnerability. I'm running kind of long. I'm not going to. I want to skip that one, but. Um, 
you know, can, you, the bottom line for me at Raytheon is this can have an impact on our bottom line, on our profit, and our reputation. We have to deliver secure software. Okay, so when are software assurance principles apply? It's just who is right code securely, right? You may think that's a correct statement. Hopefully not. <laughs> not true. It's across all life cycles. So this is a diagram that we created uh, just to kind of at a very. You could add to this a lot, but it's just at a very high level, pointing out that it spans the entire development life cycle. It's not just about writing code, and we're going to go through each of these uh, more details as we go on. Uh, you can read the detail about this later. The important things are the the red line and the green line, right? And so the red line is the traditional curve that shows if you if on a quality uh, look at, at things from a quality point of view. If you don't fix things early, it costs you more and more and more. The later in the life cycle things are discovered, we, that's a well-known thing, right? The green dash curve is meant to represent that, especially after the system gets out in the deployed operational environment, it goes up at an even faster rate, right? Um, there was a, how many of you heard of uh, IBM Rational? And they have, they bought a company called Ounce Labs about four years ago, I think, five years ago. And Ounce Labs is, was a top uh, static analysis uh, scanning company, right? And they used to have a CEO that called it the oh crap curve because people would you know, realize they had a problem after deployment that caused a security problem, and that was their reaction, right? That's what they would say. And I thought that was pretty comical. I can't, I can't even find those on the Wayback Machine, which is really unfortunate, but quite, quite good. And so it is an ongoing process. Uh, Microsoft, as you may know, took a huge hit for the lack of security early on. You know, they, they had some serious security problems, say they around the turn of the millennium uh, or, and before. And so about 2002, Bill Gates wrote a memo. He halted all development and say, we're going to focus on security for X number of weeks. And we're going to find out where our flaws are, what are we going to do about them. And so believe it or not, Microsoft has really been wonderful at promoting software assurance practices, uh, developing uh, techniques and processes and, and even tools sometimes that are free to the public. So if you want to learn some more about software assurance, Microsoft is really a nice place to go. And they have what they call their secure development life cycle. That word life cycle is funny because sometimes it's life cycle and sometimes it's life cycle. And sometimes spell checker will hate one or the other. So anyway, they call theirs SDL, secure development life cycle. But as you can see, it goes from education and training on the front end through requirements design all the way down to incident response. Okay, and that's, that's very similar to the diagram that we've developed internally. Is that language agnostic? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Obviously, when you get down to specific uh, writing the code part, you're going to have some different things you watch out for in one language versus the other. But absolutely. All right. So, what are some software and best practices? They should be trained. Software developers should be trained in in all the life cycle principles of software assurance. As I said before, management is up as high in the food chain as you can get. Need to be aware and buy in. Uh, it should be treated as an integrated, required part of the software development life cycle, not just bolted on at the end. Um, and it should be included in program reviews for projects that require developed software. And I'd probably I'd like to modify that one. It should be included on projects that have legacy software as well. There's a ton of legacy software out there that was never developed with security in mind. After the presentation, I'll tell you a long-winded joke about about that if you like. It's kind of funny. It's clean. It's not dirty. Uh, so I'd like to tell you that joke uh, later, but we don't have time for it now. But software lives out there for an incredible length of time. It wasn't designed with security. So if you're going to use an existing component, you need to think about the security of that. There's less, not much less you can do about it than it was if you're running it from, from the beginning. But there are mitigation steps, even for legacy software. Okay, training and awareness. So, uh, again, we need, need to focus on training. And as you can see, the bullets there, it's, you know, it involves managers as well as practitioners. Uh, there is a certification that ISC Squared offers called CSSLP. How many of you have heard of CISSP? Yeah, you are, anybody a CISSP? Are you the one that did the course of the, the presentation on which? Okay, so uh, how many of you have heard of CSSLP? Okay, so if you're interested in software assurance, which you clearly are fascinated by, and I'm making you even more so, obviously, by my glowing words, uh, look into the CSSLP. Okay, it's a, it's a good certification to have to help you understand in depth uh, how to secure software throughout the life cycle. CSSLP? CSSLP, Secure 
Okay, now I can't say it. Certification for Secure Software Lifecycle Professional. Yeah, and you say the acronym all the time, so sometimes you forget what it means. And so, again, I have embedded links in this. If you want to get this, you could get to them. But the, the, as I said before, the Department of Homeland Security and DOD sponsor a website, and now NIST co-sponsors that as well, uh, where they have a wealth of information about software assurance and supply chain, too. So your third-party stuff, they have a lot of uh, guidance on how to secure that. And then in industry, I mentioned Safe Code earlier. They have some really cool one-hour training videos. They're called One Hour. A lot of them are a lot shorter than that. But they'll tell you what the heck is cross-site scripting, what is the SQL injection, and a whole lot more. Um, and then there's the, uh, the Lone Star Application Security Conference, or LASCON. That's a cool thing to go to. If you ever just want to wander down to Austin, it's real cheap to register. Just go down there for one session and see if you like it. They have training on days before the conference, a little more pricey, but just the conference itself is really, you get some of the best experts in the industry on software assurance and software security. It's really great to listen to them. Uh, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I didn't put on here OWASP. If, how many of you do web development? Only one. You know about, you know about OWASP, right? Okay, okay. So OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project, is a wealth of information. Some people fuss at it because it's, you know, it, it's a volunteer thing. People don't have cycles to keep things up to date sometimes. But I'm telling you, it's a great uh, resource uh, to get started, on, especially if you're doing web application development. Um, but here's some other things. I'm not going to go through them all. You see the long list there. Oh, there it is, OWASP. <laughs> OWASP Top 10. Thank you. That's what you were trying to tell me, right? right there at the bottom of the page. And so SANS and MITRE co uh, collaborate on this top 25. It was last updated in 2013 because it doesn't change a lot. Uh, they used to change it every year and then it's kind of stayed the same because the same problems persist. If you're writing C or C++ code, your number one vulnerability is buffer overflow. You remember the little example we had, you didn't check the destination size? Well, that's a, a quality flaw, definitely. But it can be, under the right circumstances, a security flaw as well. Uh, that's a very complicated topic, but that's you know, still the number one one problem in C code. But then if you're focused on web, look at OWASP, especially their top 10. That was last updated in 2011. It doesn't change a whole lot from year to year. And there's many more we don't have time to go into. On the requirements side, uh, you might look at IBM Rational Doors is uh, giving you some assistance on managing requirements. Uh, requirements is an interesting issue in security, in software security, because you typically look at a requirement as a binary thing. You pass or you fail, and that's it, right? You know, sometimes, as I said earlier in the presentation, any kind of information assurance or security, and it's including software assurance, it's not a binary thing. It's like, do, have we lowered our risk exposure enough to an acceptable level that the organization can accept that, right? You're never going to be perfect. Okay, you're never going to get it right the first time. You got to take a look, a strong look. But you still need some high-level requirements, like, you know, if you're going from here to here, you're crossing a trust boundary. How many heard the guy talk yesterday about about uh, Stride and Dread and yeah? So he talked about trust boundaries, right? And so if you cross a trust boundary, think about encryption and integrity checks, right? Uh, so there are sometimes where you have security features. You want those as requirements. But keeping your, implementing the code securely, it's really tough. You have to keep those requirements typically at a pretty high level to pass them. And it's about risk management, not binary decisions all the time. So there's some common concepts that we talk about. I mentioned economy of mechanism earlier. Uh, that's like keep it simple, stupid. You know, don't you know, kiss uh, principle. If you don't need it, don't do it, even though it's fun to do. Uh, least common mechanism. Um, yeah, that one's kind of a tough one. It's, it's kind of the opposite of economy of mechanism. Uh, minimize the amount of mechanism common to more than one user and depend, depended on by all users. That one's kind of a tough one to get to. Uh, complete mediation. This is a, a controversial one. It says every time an object is checked, recheck authorization. Well, that can be very tedious and very slow performance-wise. You have to take that one with a grain of salt, but it's something to consider. If it's been an hour, like somebody's logged in, and they haven't done much in an hour, and you haven't timed them out, uh, you might want to reauthorize some things, right? So you need to design that in. Failing securely. This is an interesting one. If you are designing a, 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 a data, you know, something that's in a data center, and you've got a problem, sometimes you just want to shut things down. That's not pleasant. 
That violates the availability thing, but sometimes that's what you have to do. If it fails, you don't know what's going on, don't keep going. If you're in an airplane and you have a pilot flying and something goes wrong, and there's, oh, I think we have a breach here. Do you want to just shut down the airplane? I, no, right? So some, you have to use judgment on these things. Sometimes safety overrides security. When they give us our training, <clears throat> when we go in the secure areas in our building, they always tell us, if you have a medical emergency, if there's a fire, if somebody's having a heart attack and the, the medic, paramedics need in, you open up the doors, right? Well, you escape the fire, but for the emergency workers, you let them in. And you, you secure things the best you can, but human life and safety takes precedence over security, right? So, and then psychological acceptability, that's a hard one to talk about. I don't have time to get into that one a lot. Safe code, secure design principles. Uh, don't have time to go through all these. How many of you know what cross-site scripting is? Okay, you need to read about that. Um, how many know what DOM-based cross-site scripting is? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, we have this uh, general expression that client-side security is no security at all. Like we had a guy one time say, look, if he tries to enter a username without this funny characters, like maybe he's trying to do an SQL injection attack, we won't let him do that. Well, that's cool for that good, for that nice user. The bad user is going to laugh and go write his own entry point, right? It's all on the client side. He controls that. And so DOM-based cross-site scripting has to do with things that happen on the client side. So read about DOM, D, uh, DOM, document object model, DOM-based cross-site scripting, and look at OWASP. They've got some great advice on that. And you see, I'm not going to read all the others. One of the biggest things you do is this one, validate input and output. Uh, especially the input. You don't, anything that's coming in from an untrusted source, and anybody in the general public is definitely an untrusted source, but it may be from another system, right? Or maybe a user. Uh, you have to look at that input and filter. There's lots of filtering techniques depending on the context of the type of input you're gathering. Okay. Threat analysis and attack service analysis. So, uh, threat, yes. And I know we lost the recording on that, too bad. So we, we had somebody remind us from the audience that it's very difficult to train developers uh, that you never trust the user. You, you, you just can't, okay? Even if he's authenticated, he may have stolen credentials, for example. Or he, he may be an insider, right? Always filter input. So on this slide, we talk about threat modeling um, or threat analysis. And we had a the guy yesterday, uh, I don't remember his name, he talked about Stride and all that fun stuff. He was That's what he was talking about. His first part one of his part three series was on threat modeling. And it has to do with who wants to attack me and why do they want to do that, right? And then attack service is where might he enter my system? You think about all the entry points. And so there's some more blurbs. I'm running way behind on getting through these, so I'm going to go kind of quickly. But threat analysis is, you know, who, what, where, how, and really all the above, right? Know your enemy and think like an attacker. He used that phrase yesterday, too. And like he said, it's one thing to tell people to think like an attacker. Uh, you kind of need some help doing that, right, with some checklists and training. Um, and we talked about this one already. The one I'm, I skipped over was the script kitties. Uh, script kitties can do a lot of damage. You know, those are the guys that have some basic stuff. They're just out for fun and they're low skill. They don't care if I make any money. They just want to cause some havoc and see it get some glory, you know, with their friends. But then we, we mentioned the other three. Stride is something he talked about yesterday too. It's just, you know, what might the guy try to do? He might try to spoof, say he's somebody he's not and convince the system that he that he is that person that he is not. Um, elevation of privilege, the last one is a big one. You know, I, I, I found a vulnerability in software that allows me to elevate my privilege. I logged in as Whited, funny name, I know, but whatever. And, but now I'm admin or root, and now I can do anything I want. That's, that's a real bad one. And there are vulnerabilities that, that uh, like that out in the field. Speaking of in the field, do you know what CVE is? Common vulnerabilities and exposures. Yeah, that's. You, don't try to read the whole site, but you know, if you want to know about a topic, go to the. Let's see, it's managed now at the National Vulnerability Database by NIST. And you go out there and put in a keyword search, and you know, tells you all the recent, well, 
all the entries it has for fielded vulnerabilities in software, including operating systems. Yeah. And the government has something called IAVA that kind of shadows that, or maybe precedes that in some cases. And the tax service, we talked about that, and that the goal will reduce the attack surface of the software as much as possible. And that gets back to the economy of uh, lease mechanism and uh, Easter eggs don't do that. You know, keep it as small as you can. Just the things you got to do to meet the requirements and, and, and have good security. And there are some tips on reducing uh, attack surface. Turn off features, observe lease privilege. Lease privilege is saying, well, I'm an admin, so I can be able to do anything, right? No, 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 no. If you're an admin, you need to be able to perhaps do some free start things like delete files and modify files that other users can't do. But you may not even have read privilege to some things, right? Like an admin can reset your password. He can't read your password. Well, unfortunately, he can in a lot of systems. Badly designed. But theoretically, he can't read that password. He can, he can, he can reset it, but he can't, can't read it. So that's least privilege or an example of least privilege. And there's something called attack trees. This gives you a hierarchical way to think about the tax. Uh, and then KPEC. Uh, MITRE Corporation uh, runs a whole program called Making Security Measurable. And we already mentioned CVE, and they kind of turned most of that over to NIST. Uh, but they also have something called Common Weakness Enumeration, and, and that gives you all the weaknesses that might happen in software. You can read about cross-site scripting and uh, SQL injection and buffer overflows, and it'll actually give you a tree of, of things that get more and more specific on those topics. Uh, KPEC, or Common Attack Pattern, so we're talking about attack patterns, is another one they run. It talks about how the bad guys go about attacking systems and attacking software, and it references CWEs. This is a really cool website. You all take a look at it. And you know, there's some more about it as well. I don't really have time to go through it a lot more. Another thing I like a lot is called uh, misuse or abuse case modeling. How many of you use UML? No? Okay. So uh, UML is a design, primarily a software design tool, and helps you do things in kind of pictures and graphs, at least in part. Come on in. And uh, misuse case modeling is sort of a companion to that. So if we have a if we have a use case, it might look something like that. That's a that's a poor man whited representation of a use case, right? But then if we do the misuse case, you think like a bad guy. Remember, think like a criminal, think like a crook, think like a cyber thief. And that, then you add all these other things that you, maybe you didn't think about in the normal functional path, right? You want to think about how bad, you want know, to think like a bad guy, what else might he do? So misuse case modeling is, is a very useful thing to mix. Let's move on to uh, implementation. So here coding standard, this is the CERT. Uh, CERT is an organization run by Carnegie Mellon, Software Engineering Institute, and they do a lot of great stuff. They have a top 10 secure coding practices. Number one is validate input. We've talked about that. Heed compiler warnings. How many of you compile code and say, oh, it's just a warning, I'll ignore it, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, don't do that as much as you can. It's really not a good idea. Um, architect and design for security policies. Keep it simple. We talked about keep it simple already. Default deny. Uh, you know, years ago, systems would come and, oh, you can kind of do everything. If you want to clamp it down, go ahead and reconfigure. Well, how many general users are going to do that, right? So products nowadays are generally shipped in, in, with configurations that don't let you do much of anything, right? You have to turn things on and say, yes, I want to allow that. And when you write your software, it's the same principle. Um, at least privilege, we talked about that just a moment ago. Sanitized data, that's kind of like filtering your input. Uh, practice defense in depth. You know, we talked about network defense. We're not advocating throw away network defenses. It's just, you know, you need to add to it. Uh, use effective quality assurance techniques. Okay, that's a good one. Adopt a secure coding standard. In fact, they have uh, written their own secure coding standard for C, C++, Java, and I think they've added Android, which is usually mostly in Java, but it's specific to Android. Uh, they have some in Perl, I think. And they have completely revamped their website in the last year. Uh, so some of the things they had before are now gone, and they've added some new things. But they do have some really terrific uh, ideas that are, you, earlier, uh, someone in the audience asked about, uh, is it language specific? Well, this is, right? So when you're writing Java, you need to know the Java things to watch out for, and, and so forth and so on. Okay, static analysis. Um, 
Okay, so we talked a little bit earlier about CWE. Now, I also talked about the SANS Top 25, right? And so the tools, when you, when you use a static analysis tool, it will tell you in its own words what it thinks it found. But it will also usually make a reference to CWE and say, if you want to know more, go to this, go to MITRE's CWE site, or read on this CWE number, it'll tell you some more about, it'll give you, oftentimes give you good code examples, bad code examples, where it's introduced in the life cycle, impacts, mitigations, it's really, a, each CWE is very rich, and there's hundreds of them, so it's a really wonderful resource. Um, and I don't, I think some of them make reference to OWASP Top 10 as well. But I want to say a little more about static analysis. Um, Static analysis is a fun thing. It's basically a compiler, uh, at least on the front end. It'll take code and tokenize it just like any other compiler would. But on the back end, instead of producing native binary code or byte code, it will produce a representation of your logic from end to end. So then, you, then it will allow you to run checkers against the code. And it will track data. Oh, I found an entry point for data. And it will follow it through all the combinations of paths possible with few limitations, surprisingly and say, oh wait, you consume that data here, here, and here, and you didn't filter it. So are you sure it's secure? The problem with stat static analysis, the good thing is it's very complete. You know, it's symbolic execution, so-called, so it looks at all the co combinations of paths, but it's very, it's very noisy, it's, very, it's not always right. It has lots of false alarms, right? It'll say, this is a problem when in fact you know, no, it's really not, you just thought it was. Whereas dynamic analysis, which we're more accustomed to, when you, dynamic analysis is always right when you get a failure. There's something wrong. This was supposed to pass and it didn't pass. It may be your test procedure, it may be the system, but it's always right. It's something wrong, right? But it's just not complete. You can't cover all the code, uh, all the combinations of paths through the code uh, with dynamic analysis very effectively. So it, it takes both of them together. Uh, Are these features normally built into the compilers? No. It's third party. Now you'll have free tools like FineBugs, uh, some of the lint checkers, uh, but I right. I highly recommend you get a commercial tool. If you're an IBM shop, uh, get AppScan Source Edition. That, that's the former Ounce Labs folks I was talking about. Uh, they do a nice job. Their pricing was pretty funky five years ago. I think they've improved that a lot. Uh, with IBM now, you buy tokens, and you can apply that to any of the rational app scan pieces you want. And so I, I, I would re highly recommend that if you're an IBM shop. If you're not an IBM shop, I would look at Coverity or Clockwork or uh, Fortify. Now, Fortify is kind of leveled off since I got by, bought by HP. Check Marks is up and coming. There are definitely, I don't want to recommend a specific vendor because I'm not here to do that and that does not represent Raytheon's point of view. But just from experience, those are the main players. All right. Third party reviews. If you do man if you do manual code reviews, which you should, add to that somebody looking out for security. The static analysis tools will find stuff. I'm gonna say find stuff that's not a problem, but they will miss some things. And so it's always good to have somebody just kind of looking in general from top to bottom you know, module you're reviewing for security flaws. And it takes some training to do that, but that's an important thing to do as well. And of course, I know I'm talking like, I, like you have an infinite amount of money, right? You can't do everything, but these are, in an ideal world, these are the things you would do on every project. Dynamic test, about some kinds of testing. White box testing, obviously that's where you have access to everything inside. Static analysis is, a, is an example of white box testing. Black box, I don't know what's inside, I'm just testing the outside of it. The fuzz testing, now that's sending random and malformed data into the system and looking for edge cases and corner cases and boundary conditions and trying to, trying to it's a break it test in a way. Uh, I just found out yesterday, how many heard uh, Bill Toomey yesterday? Yeah, I, this isn't nearly as interesting as he has, is it? I don't run marathons. You know, he runs 100 mile ultra marathons. I run 100 yards, I'm out of breath, so it's, we're very different. But uh, he talked about that yesterday. Just this week, uh, Codenomicon, which is one of the principal uh, fuzz testing companies, has been bought by a company called Synopsys, and they also own Coverity. So if you're in the commercial world, that might be of interest to you. Um, penetration testing, that's just attacking it every angle you can and seeing if you can break in, right? It's very common, Some often shortened to pen testing. So when you say pure pen testing, we don't pick up a pen and try to do something, right? It's short for penetration. Trying to penetrate the, your system and see if we can attack it. Okay, so then when we go to 
life cycle operations support and disposal, you still need to think about security. And I've listed some of the things here, like continuous monitoring. Um, you know, just just testing it once and throwing it out there is not enough. You have to actively be monitoring your networking, looking for threats all the time. Okay, may I see some examples, please? Okay, so remember this little code example we threw up and our friend at the back here spotted one problem. So let me go through the things that I see here. Okay, so number one, I see that code does not check arg C for a number of arguments. Okay, so if you go check arg one, well, it's not there. So you, yeah, that's undefined behavior and maybe a, maybe a core dump or whatever. And that's CWE 476. Um, <clears throat> this is a picky thing. This is a style thing that I like. Uh, I don't know, buff size is 256. Maybe that's more than enough to account for any size buffer you anticipate, right? But if it comes from the outside, you can't be guaranteed. And so, uh, but it also sort of, and we'll get to that here in a bit, but it also sort of infers that he's expecting to be able to handle 256 bytes of real data, right? Well, he didn't allow for the null terminator on the end, right? Um, so that's CWE 193. Well, I, the way I wrote C code, since it's null terminated, which I'm not crazy about, I always put a plus one literally in the in the specification. So I know I got buff size characters that are really good and I can deal with. Uh, but that's that's just the way I like to write things. Uh, code doesn't validate uh, the content of argv1. Remember, filter your input. Uh, that's generically CWE20. But if you go look at that on the MITRE website, it got a huge tree of other things uh, specific to different languages and operational environments. And then, like our friend at the back said, number four uh, problem, CWE 120, uh, didn't check the size of the destination buffer. So now you get a buffer overflow. Uh, you know, way back, I got time to tell us, I think. Way back in, uh, before the mid-90s, you had this, you know, deep web or whatever hacker community, and they were on message boards. They knew about each other. They exchanged stuff, but they were very private. You, it was very hard to get in. and. We, no, the public didn't know about them, right? Well, in 1996, one of them published an article in Frack Ezine, or online or magazine, called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. So if you want some fun reading, go read Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. So he pointed out that if you craft input in a certain way, it looks like executable code, and you mess with the return pointers, uh, and you stick it on the stack, um, and you can force it to go to your code. It's called shell code, right? And you can do anything you want. So that's smashing the stack for fun and profit. And there's lots of defenses about, against that, but every time there's a defense, they come along with another sophistication layer to, to make it still possible. So that's, that's a big one. That's, that's absolutely, I think, the biggest problem in that code. I'm glad you spotted that. And then I also would argue that uh, can, the attacker can exploit that uh, code that does not provide a the format string is the first argument. So, and that's CEE 134. Now, most of you probably don't write C or C++ code. Well, if you write C++, you probably don't use format statement or printf statements, Maybe you might. Uh, I know I did, because it's what I knew how to do. Uh, but if you don't always provide that first argument as a format string, otherwise there's this fundamental thing where they can read data and actually they can actually write some data. Percent %n actually writes data. So there you go. So there's at least five things in that little five line program, I found five flaws, right? So the static analysis tools are really good at finding stuff like that, but it may miss them. I mean, that's where you, the manual code reviews are also a secondary one take. Just a quick thing, I just wondered how many actual lines of code today would have to be the security? Well, here's, here's the catch, right? To do an if check on is my buffer too big or not, that's easy, right? The real problem is what do you do about that? <clears throat> and the, the content under the if statement or under the else statement maybe, that, that sometimes is the problem. And you really have to think through that and design it well. And so yes, it will get bigger. You're right. That's right. Get, you know, that's correct. Building security in it, it, it takes some time and effort. My, my hope is that over time, this all this will migrate down into the college and even high school level as we start teaching people how to write code. Of course, by high school, most five-year-olds 20 years from now will write code. But anyway, you know, hopefully at a very young, early age, you get ingrained with how to write things securely. 
and it's not a problem. My, my bigger hope is that we can do more through modeling and we won't write code anymore, we'll just generate it, but that's a pipe dream, so anyway. Uh, so here's an example, I'm running real short on time, I wanna skip through this pretty quick. Yeah, I'm not even getting near through my slides, but there's an example of, of cases where you have a regular uh, normal URL and JSP code that looks like this, and the return page is that. And then if we have a malicious user, well, look what he can do. He can stick a script in the user input, and now he's echoed back, you know, your, your document cookie. Ooh, that's not good. Well, uh, so he gets even more malicious, you know, he does something like that. He gets ugly in a hurry. Uh, SQL injection, the beginning. So you start with something like, uh, here's a, now you, you'd never design something, this is a simple example, right? Where we have an entry point in the URL address bar. But for example, you know, there he's got his uh, user ID and password in clear text in the URL bar. Don't ever do that. But as a simple example, let's say you had something like that, and underneath the hood, the code was going to say, select star from user table where user ID equal test and password equal secret. Okay, well that looks, that, that's a valid SQL query, right? Uh, but then he turns malicious. Okay, so now he does something like this. Well, what's all that dash dash and, well, hmm, you know what? It's going to look like this thing in the middle here. And, uh, okay, and so dash dash, well, that's a comment in SQL, or at least in a lot of SQL, right? And so the rest of the rights just ignored. And so you actually wind up with is select star from user table where user ID equals admin. He can read all the users in the table. Okay, not a good thing. So that's just a simple example. Oh, I am at my summary. Yay! Okay, I thought I was, had a long way to go. Uh, so the bottom line is be prepared, right? Software assurance is becoming a requirement, especially for US DOD contracts. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2011 and 2013 are driving that. Um, the challenge is yours, right? Uh, will you commit to developing software in a secure fashion to protect the interests of customers? our nation and all of us who use your software? And I hope the answer to that is yes. I'd be glad, there's my email address. As you can see, the hair has slid off my head onto my chin. And uh, this picture is a little bit old, but there's my email address. I would be delighted to talk to you guys anytime. Send me an email if you have a question about software assurance. Uh, what was it you said about SQL injection? What's this DOM-based thing? What did you say? I'd be glad to take a question from you. So. Any questions? You've got five minutes if there's anything to do. But we probably all want to get out of here, right? Go do something fun for the afternoon. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.